choose your battles when you get married and it's like is that what you do I did, and I mean, the tricky thing is what, how, how to choose the battle in a responsible, non-destructive way. In a loving way. Yes, because you get angry, and you want to hurt, and you want to, and you want to win. Welcome everyone to the School of Greatest Podcast. We've got the iconic David Walden iconic. in the house, man. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you, Excited too. Excited about this. Yeah, me too. Um, when you walked in, we had a 10 second hug. Yeah, it was about 10, maybe 11 or 12. 11, 12 yeah. seconds. We, we enjoy a long, warm hug. Well, I would say enjoy is an interesting word there because when I first saw you, it had been four years yep. yesterday, and you came in and I tried to pull away, yeah. and you held on to me. And I had this weird thing in my head going, this is something I've thought about doing with people. This feels incredibly awkward to me. But then as we held it in, I was like, I am not only getting more used to this and into it, but I like him more now. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. And you remember, you know, I've been known for giving long, awkward hugs. Yeah. As an experiment originally is what I started doing probably like 10, 12 years ago. Yeah. Experimenting it. And my life has been about experiments. Uh -huh. Whenever I'm afraid of something, I say, how can I go all in on this thing and create like a game or an exercise or an experiment around it uh -huh. and see what happens on the other side? I'll do a month, a three month experiment. Great. And I started doing this because um, I wanted to have deeper connections with people. Mm -hmm. but I felt like people were on surface level a lot. And especially growing up in Ohio, playing sports, guys had kind of this phobia around hugs. Sure. Even just like a high five and like a little yeah. bring it in handshake was almost too much, right? Yeah. It was like, don't touch me, it was this phobia. And so I just wanted to change that. And I was like, I really wanna be more intimate with people mm -hmm. and have deeper connections. And so I started doing that and it just kind of stuck. Now I was telling you <clears throat> that we have to be careful in certain climates of, the, uh, of humanity of when that's appropriate and understanding people's energy. So yeah. sometimes I don't always do that, but. You read people, you you're not read just people. like 12 yeah. seconds no matter what. Yeah, no, I read people. Yeah, and I remember like President Clinton, or President right? Obama just I for know. 12 seconds. Yeah, it might be, yeah. might get yeah. shot. <laughs> I remember um, we had a, uh, a meditation teacher of mine come on uh, for the first time. She wasn't my teacher at that time, mm -hmm. but I was just meeting her mm -hmm. and I gave her a hug and she was almost, it's almost like she saw a ghost because she's a monk and she doesn't touch anyone. Oh boy. And so <laughs> Tiffany was there and it was, I oh. felt horrible the whole time I was interviewing her because I just felt like I broke some sacred and, thing. And she, did she recover? Did she forgive she or was, was fine, she yeah. rattled? No, oh, she no. moved on. I mean, she's got, you know, the principle of just like not letting, not holding on to things. Yeah, sure. Because you're in suffering when you hold on to something. It was actually probably a really good test to see how, how, what level she was at. Yeah. Are you, you going to suffer? Are you going to hold on to yeah. this? Are you a true goes, teacher? Are you yeah. start resenting me? <laughs> um, so we, uh, we connected years ago for probably, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, maybe? Very briefly, yeah. But we had a great connection. Yeah, I agree. And so it's good to see you again. Yeah, and I remember you reached out to me, I think through uh, Instagram, and I, admit, I admitted to you, I think I did a Dundax's podcast, uh -huh. and you would, I admitted to you that I've always been like, why didn't I reach out to Lewis after that thing? And then you just sent me your, your phone, phone number, like immediately, and I yeah. was like, I just like this guy's style. It's all good. It's just opens it up, it opens up yeah, man. communication without, we get all worried about, I don't know, not being liked perhaps. Exactly, man. Yeah, and, I, and I've, I've liked following your journey. I think I first heard about you on, it was either About a Boy or a New Girl. Yeah. And that's where I first saw you and I started learning more about you from there and I really liked your style as an actor. And oh, you're a better you. human being. You're a better <laughs> human being. I started learning more about you recently. Um, we both went to boarding school. Mm -hmm. You went to a ball boys school first, yeah. and then you went to a co-ed boarding school. <clears throat> yep. Which I went to just a co-ed boarding school. Okay. So and, you've never been in a single sex environment. Uh, well, I was in a boys dorm. Yeah. And then across the campus was the girls dorm. Probably similar to you, right? Yeah, 100%. And it was all like occasionally sneaking out. Occasionally, right? Occasionally. But was it pretty strict for you? Yeah, we get in very big trouble. Yeah. And that's part of the, I think, the appeal 
was, you know, breaking rules is exciting it's for a fun. teenager. Exactly. Getting out and going to the girls' dorm and yeah, you're like sneaking, sneaking through the window yeah. and like banging on it. Yeah. I only did it once or twice, actually. I was pretty terrified. Were you, <laughs> <laughs> Were you a by the rules kind of a guy? Did you always mm. follow the rules? That was my family's culture, but I would think everyone would say that I was the black sheep. I have a lot of high achieving siblings. Like uh -huh. most of my sisters were all American athletes and really? really abided by the rules. And I kind of was like, I'm not as good at sports as they are. How do I become extraordinary? And I was like, I might as well, <laughs> you know, like just be different than them. Maybe I don't know. Were they um, <clears throat> lacrosse? Were they like New England oh, lacrosse? I mean, the purest uh, field, field hockey, hockey, and hockey and lacrosse. Oh my gosh, amazing! Yeah. And we were talking before. You were asking me uh, if I if I have a cocktail because we were talking about doing golf sometime. Yeah, I didn't and know you didn't. Dr I ever. don't drink. I've never been drunk, and I'll have a Bailey's on ice. Oh, you will once or twice a year. Okay. Oh, Bailey's on ice. One. On a very. Maybe two shots. Maybe two. But it's like I'll sip on it for an hour. It's delicious. It's delicious. Liqueur, delicious. Right? And sometimes I'll put it in hot chocolate for Christmas Attaboy. or something. But um, I think I had a, and you were asking me earlier, why, is there a reason why? Yeah. And when I was a kid growing up, my two older sisters both had some challenges with some, um, some alcohol, drug stuff. They weren't like addicted, but they had some instances that were scary moments, mm -hmm. right? Then... And I saw them really sick at times from this alcohol stuff, like throwing up and being sick for days or whatever, right? So, and my sister, went, uh, my brother went to prison for four years. When I was eight, he right. went to prison for drugs, for selling drugs to an under, undercover cop. Oh. And so we would drive to the, uh, the visiting room. It was about a two and a half hour drive to get there, the uh, prison, every weekend for four or five hours. And I would watch we'd be with all the other families and all the other inmates. And I would just witness and observe what was happening. And it, I don't know if it scared me, but I was just like, I don't want to be here one day. Mm -hmm. And he was there for four and a half years. He got off in good behavior. But um, I just remember being like, I don't want to be here. Yeah. This is not a place I'm, and if it's smoking weed, if it's drugs, if it's alcohol, whatever it is, I just don't want to do it if that's going to get me here. Yeah. And so I remember I used to steal cigarettes when I was 12. Okay. I was acting out as a young kid. I was the youngest of four and I would steal from like the grocery store. Oh, from, okay. So like a, you know, a felony. Yes. Yes. I, I would steal almost every, every time I went into a store, I would steal, I had to steal something for about a year and a half. Wow. What is that called? Like There's klepto a, or something yeah, like that? Yeah. Well, kleptomaniac maybe. Exactly. But I thought that was stealing from other people, but sure. I, so yeah, it, it was great. like, a, it became a game for me. Yeah. And I started stealing cigarettes. And I would, I remember I wouldn't even smoke them. I would try to like take a puff and I wouldn't even inhale it. Because okay. I was so afraid if I did something, what it would do to me. Um, but that was my bad phase. And, and I That's just, good. and then in high school, I went to a private boarding school, which I know you went to the boarding school as mm -hmm. well. So you weren't allowed to have alcohol on campus first off. And right. kids weren't really going out and buying it. Oh, they weren't? At 16, it just wasn't happening. Yeah. And then I went to college and then I was playing uh, college football and there was alcohol everywhere yeah. after every game parties cake stands the whole thing and I remember just saying to myself I'm not going to get to where I want in my dreams as a pro athlete if I do what everyone else is doing mm -hmm. and so it just never became interesting for me at college and so I made a commitment that I wouldn't have one sip of alcohol in college not a sip not a sip then after college was over I was like why would I start now did that become your identity in college to the people? Like, oh, there's Lewis. People knew. Yeah. And, and girls would try to, like, get you to do whatever I could to, to make it happen. And when you were with girls who were inebriated and attracted to you, how would that work? I would just say no. Oh. I would say no. It was weird, man, because I didn't want to ever be taking advantage of anyone yeah. or be that guy. And so I would just be like, no, if you're drinking, I'm not going to do anything. Wow. Good for you. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> but now it's carried on. You're 36. 36. And, and, and I'm like a Bailey's. Bailey's. <clears throat> but that first Bailey's you had, was that a weird experience? Or were you, um, was it like, just like whatever? Well, my sisters gave it to me in hot chocolate, so I didn't really taste it. Oh. It's just like, oh, it's like Did sweet. Did they sneak it in like you they, didn't know? They, they had some and I drank some of it and I was like, oh, that's really good. And they were like, yeah, it's Bailey's inside of it. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe I'll have one, you know? But, um, but I've just never decided to do it. Yeah. I've, never had, I've never had beer. Or, I think I had one sip of wine. Yeah. And it tasted really bad to me. So. Well, it's a really, <clears throat> you know, I, I, this isn't a scientific method, but a lot of the people who I, I inspire me and are doing really mm -hmm. kind of 
prolific work and deep work, certainly in entertainment. A lot of them are sober. Really? Yeah. Who are the most inspiring? Well, like for Dax, you? you know, Dax Shepard. Uh, he doesn't drink? He, no, well, he's, uh, yeah, he was an AA. So he's like, you know, he <clears> had. <throat> a, he was an alcoholic. Issue. He was, yeah. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and even people like Howard Stern to me, like, you know, you, you would think. And he just doesn't touch anything and no drugs no alcohol <clears throat> no yeah i mean i think maybe he drinks a little bit like the tiniest bit um and as you get older like you can i can i've taken long stretches without it and the amount of productivity and my my wife is into this hashtag called sober curious huh. which is gaining steam because there's such a pervasive culture of drinking i was just shooting a movie in chicago for a month <clears throat> called later days and and I mean, cities like Boston and Chicago, it's just like, it's, it's just paired That's what you with do. everything. There's bars everywhere, pubs, everywhere. You're drinking everywhere. It, After work, you always go for a drink. Yeah, and, it, and it, I think a lot of people are starting to question that culture and why it's there and how much good it's actually doing. And are, so that Sober Curious movement is, is kind of fascinating because wow. um, so she's work, doing that. And I, but I have this kind of, my relationship to alcohol is strange because I know the physical ramifications and the willpower after a night of drinking, you know, if you have a great diet going or whatever, and you're being great, it, it just, it, it derails you in such a profound way. And you drink, you're going to start eating the bad, next you're morning. You're like, who cares? And I'm just going to rip like, you know, five pizzas. Yeah. yeah. The, it, um, but at the same time, it's ability to bring people together or to have bonding experiences. Truthful experiences. And truthful and get a, and, and, and it kind of silence a lot of things you're fascinated with, which are, you know, like guilt and unworthiness uh -huh. and, and, and shame and all these things like they, I, I, there's theories that alcohol, it doesn't make you a different person. It's just, if you have all those things coexisting, like if on your highest level, you are all love and gratitude yes. and sharing, but you have feelings of unworthiness as well, like we all do. The alcohol just mutes that voice. The unworthy voice. The unworthy voice temporarily. So that the way you behave is actually pure love. It's more loving. And wow. you see great, you know, I, I have friends who are kind of like, they're kind of like <laughs> tough, angry guys, and they drink, and it's like it's like they're they, hugging you with twelve oh, second hugs all day, and it's not annoying. You know, it's like oh, it's like, and a lot of people would say like, God, I feel more like myself when I'm drinking, and I that's that's across the board. A lot of people feel that way, so that's why they continue to drink more and more, probably. Yeah, and I think like anything, the more you know, the the edges, the extremes are where we run into problems, yeah. and if you can find a little middle ground, it can be okay. So it's like, and I I know a drug <clears throat> counselor. Who would say it's not that anything is bad or good? It's just your it, your relationship to it. Why do you think people feel more of who they are when they're drinking, and why do you think people can't feel that way when they're living normal life without it? Well, uh, my very rudimentary theory is uh, kind of based on this wonderful book called Power Versus Force by Dr. Hawkins, which was like a pretty big book in the '70s. But it's basically like it's kind of what I just said. It's you're born with all these layers of consciousness and like the most sort of the most destructive he would argue Hawkins is like shame guilt and and that the big unworthiness thing. yes and we all kind of are born with that in some level uh, different levels of it and no one really knows why you just see a little kid and you can see a heaviness or a cloud yeah. or, and so um, but we also within us have, you know, that super high level stuff, the stuff that every great, you know, religion mm -hmm. ultimately is about, which is that oneness and love mm -hmm. and connection. And I think everyone has it inside them at all times. And what we do during our day, what we decide, our intention, all those things can elevate us to a certain extent. But that doesn't mean that stuff isn't down there still. And to me, certain, uh, substances can mute that and so people identify themselves with that mm -hmm. love mm -hmm. but with alcohol they're just not feeling that stuff so they're like oh I feel like more it's more like me because I'll, I'll kind of my problems when I'm not worrying mm -hmm. you know and I'm not doubting do you feel like a lot of actors feel insecure and unworthy oh, most yeah. of the time yeah I mean it's a hard one mm -hmm. I 
<clears throat> yeah. And this isn't true. You have a lot of actor friends, right? Yeah. And I think on a certain level, we, we all want to be loved and feel important uh, and seen like everyone. And there's a sense of, you know, when you're 17 and you want to be an actor, generally it's going to be about how is this going to help me get laid right if you're like on some level is this going to help me be attractive yeah like most musicians i mean yeah there's obviously exceptions but it's kind of like right. you know, it was poor teenagers everyone's ruled by that everyone's ruled it's crazy, by it. it's like it? the most powerful force on earth that sexuality stuff so you know all the stuff that you're doing i love being able to talk about yeah i don't know things that are kind of expand the dialogue and honor the fact that wanting to have sex is so deeply ingrained and powerful in our biology and oh our psyche and everything god you know if anything it's the most yeah. and so to write off that there's something shameful about that is mm -hmm. not good it's just more like are you in control of your your shit you know <laughs> and and because everyone's yeah. raging i mean go to a Watch a movie set, <laughs> watch a movie set and go for a month of like a shoot and then have the rap party and watch all the like built in sexual tension, like kind really? of explode. Really? Oh yeah. Like any, you know, it's like there's movies about like any business is like that, right? Like the corporate office party. Mm -hmm. It's like an alcohol, unfortunately you know, it, the judgment kind of goes and people make mistakes. So it's, it's, it's a dangerous world out there. But what's the root of it, in my opinion, is the fact that everyone is a sexual creature and it's on their mind whether they want to or not. You mm. know, it's just like, you just feel it instinctually, you know, like. Does that happen a lot? Of, how many movie sets have you been on? Because you do mostly TV, right? Have you done yeah, I've been on a bunch of movie sets, though, too. It's <clears> the same <throat> with TV. I mean, it's not that people are going around being <laughs> sexual all day. Right. I'm just saying that I would like people to honor the fact that, you know, it's there, you know, mm -hmm. and that it's obviously a really tough world right now to navigate for everybody. And... Uh, some of the dialogue I see happening seems a little black and white to me, and I yeah. just which, which dialogue? Just all just the the, the dialogue about um, the giant gray area of of interaction of you know one of the things, and we may have to erase this because it's just such a hot topic. Uh -huh. So I'll I'll be Let driving. Home. <laughs> Maybe I'll get a, a thing for you guys, <clears throat> but one of the things. You know, I've talked to a lot of women, right? And they'll say something like the days of like complimenting a sweater or something, they're kind of like over it. Like they don't want those compliments about certain yeah, articles like sweater, of clothing. Yeah. yeah, like, oh, I love your sweater. Like even that can be a problem now for, for women because it feels like it's coming from a maybe a sexual place or a, oh, let me, whatever. Uh, but a lot of the girls I've talked to are very open. It's like if the guy is attractive, if the guy is like someone you're attracted to, then it's okay. But if it's like someone who's not attractive, then you don't like it. Right? So how do you know if they're attracted to you or not? A lot of guys are trying to say, hey, I'm a great guy. Like I'm a catch. So how am I supposed to know that you think I'm creepy when yeah. I'm not? You yeah. know, and I think <clears throat> to me, I'm like looking, I'm like, <laughs> looking at the girls. Sure. <laughs> look at the girls. <laughs> they're like, yes or no. <laughs> I'm like uh, terrified right now. But no. I think that's an example of a gray area that just doesn't get yeah. talked it's about. It's tough. Yeah, it's tough for, look, guys have had it good in so many ways. Um, right now, everyone's pretty darn lost. And if you talk openly and truthfully about it, most likely it's going to be reactive and eviscerated. Yeah. Uh, and you saw it. So everyone's quieting until some energy shifts where they can have a real better dialogue about it uh but anyway that's that's some of my thoughts on it but do you have do you have any uh male actor friends that have gone through some challenging times that have come to you for wisdom and advice and no no one, <laughs> no one comes to me for wisdom and advice no uh no i i'm trying to think if anyone's really been in trouble no i just in the beginning of the wonderful me too movement where you know women are finally getting what they deserve in a lot of ways. I mean, and there's still tons of stuff to be done, but uh, you know, someone pointing out a gray area, kind of like on Twitter or whether it's Matt Damon yeah, or yeah, something yeah. like that, just getting eviscerated. And, and uh, yeah. I think by, by definition, 
there's going to be no nuanced discussion of, of gray areas on Twitter. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> People just stay away and from those yeah. are the headlines. And, yeah, and exactly. so, uh, yeah, I mean, long form stuff like this is a way of doing it. And I think For it's sure. really powerful. Yeah. And I don't know. I just want everyone to kind of forgive each other more. Wouldn't that be amazing? That would be really great. Why do you think we hold on to so much anger or frustration for so long about anything, not just Me Too stuff or, but anything in general? Why do you think we hold on to these things for so long? That's a great question. I really don't know. I mean, I, if I could take a stab at it, that anger is an actually pretty, it can feel really good to be angry, especially if you're sad or, you know, have any of the lower things. Like, yeah. Anger is actually pretty powerful. Like in sports, for example, if you're scared on like a big match point, there's mental mm. coaches who say, just work yourself, find Get something angry. to be angry because that's going to be a more powerful state than wow. fear. Yes. Uh, so I don't know. That's a stab at that yeah. deep philosophical question. Do you feel like you're an angry person or have you had anger throughout the last 15 years of acting? Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm not really angry around... I have a lot of anger in my personal life. I don't know where it comes from. My dad had a big temper. Uh, and, you know, I, it's scary at times, you know, uh, and kids, I don't know we how can't many control listeners kids. you can't, and they can trigger you in the so, deepest ways. That, and they know how to manipulate you probably, right? They start Just, getting there. But even when, before they're in that stage, they're, they're triggering, you know, whatever your issues are with yourself or how you were raised. And generally, like my son, who is a boy, if he does something that reminds me of maybe something that I don't like about myself, you know, if, let's say hmm. for a, an example, like, you know, a culture where being a guy and being scared isn't really allowed. And then you see your son being scared. It's cute for a bit, but then at a certain age, you know, it starts to trigger me like, hey, man, like. Get it together. You know, <laughs> How old is, is your son? five. You know what I mean? <laughs> or I'm like, you can't be, right. I'm not going to escort you upstairs. Right. There's nothing upstairs. You got to be brave. And right. I try to be. I've gone under the, the covers the whole time. I've gone under the bed. I've shown you there's no monsters. It's yeah. Like, yeah. When are you going to grow up? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, but yeah, I, I find anger to be very confusing. And, uh, you know, obviously relationships spark it. And yeah. kids can. Um, a lot of the yogic principles, it's just like, it's primal anger that, you, you know, it's born with. You can see a two-year-old rage like nothing else. It's not, I don't think anger is shameful. I don't think it's something, I think it should be embraced and loved in that sort of spirit of how do I take this innate part of me and make it non-destructive? Mm -hmm. And that can be through, you know, CrossFit and kickboxing or whatever. Meditation, yoga. Meditation, yoga. But sometimes that's hard too because you can think you've released it, but anger is a trick. Suppressed it or something. Yeah, instead. it's got a ton of energy and anger is incredibly it powerful. And it can come back in a moment and trigger you. Oh, man. And that, so, you you know, I think you've mentioned you have some anger. You know, I think all we all do. I think I've, uh, I think I had a lot of anger and sports allowed me to release it in a very uh, safe environment yeah. to where I didn't have it because yeah. I could get it out in this container of two, three hours and let any of my emotions out you know, just headbutt people all day, and then I was fine. How, and then I was, I mean, I was exhausted of all my energy, and I was just like, oh, I could sleep peacefully. And do you uh, uh, still get triggered, or are you, are you kind of? I get triggered all the time. I, I, the thing is, I'm so aware of it now. Yeah. I'm so aware of it that I'm like, okay, it's kind of like I recognize the, the two wolves inside of me, the, the good wolf and the bad wolf. I love that old metaphor. And I'm like, okay, which one wants to win right now? Which one am I gonna feed? And well, sometimes that. I feed the, the bad wolf yeah. and it comes out, you uh -huh. know, and, and, but most of the time I'm feeding the good wolf because I'm consciously like, okay, this is triggering me. Why is this triggering me? Why do I want to punch someone in the face right now or go through a wall? Yeah. Sometimes I feel like I could take down a building. I literally feel like I could run through this building yeah. and the whole thing would crumble. Yeah. I know I would die before that would happen, but I feel like in my mind, I feel like that's possible sometimes with that much power. Think of that, that much energy. I mean, it's that much energy, but I, I'm so conscious and aware of it that I, that I just practice the right things. And I make sure, you know, I was having a, a challenging conversation with my girlfriend last night. We have a long distance relationship. 
she's Latina, which you are familiar with. Your yeah. wife's Latina. Yeah, from Venezuela. And um, so there's a there's a language uh, difference. She's probably seventy percent in speaking English fluent. Okay. So there's sometimes some misinterpretation sure. of like nuances. <clears throat> there's a cultural difference. There's a, just human being differences. Yeah. We're just different people. And I remember. I was like getting triggered by something she was saying and I was like, I could react and I could get loud and do those things or I can, and in that moment, I just started to smile. I started to Ooh. smile at her. I was like, okay. I started myself getting like clenched and defensive and being like, she doesn't understand me. She doesn't get me right now. Like there's, there's a misunderstanding of our culture, yeah. our language, but let me just smile. Let me just smile. And keep smiling, and she kept like speaking, <laughs> she kept saying stuff. Is this on a FaceTime? On FaceTime. Oh, okay. So I just kept, I was just like, I'm like smiling, smiling, and she goes, why are you smiling? I go, I just love you. I just love you so much. And then she started smiling, and then we started laughing, and then it's like it became calmer and calmer and relaxing. And would you ever tell her, though, that that, that something had been triggered? Um, probably, yeah, yeah. I think I told her later in the conversation. Yeah, because that's I was like, this is the, the way it makes me feel. This is how, what I'm experiencing. Right, so that to me is the biggest thing is, because if you just smile and say, I love you, and then never right. have that conversation, you now share. you've buried something. You've buried it. Yeah. So you've got to say what's on your mind. Yeah. And that's something that I, and we all struggle with. Yeah. Uh, like there's that old thing, you know, choose your battles when you get married. And it's like. Is that what you do? I did. And I'm like going more and I'm sorry, sweetheart, if you're listening, but I'm, I'm going to choose all the battles because I actually think the battles are, uh, I'm, I'm beginning to, and I was treating Jordan Peterson kind of got me on this train was like the festering of an unchosen battle, you know, is legit. And I think, um, it's like a bomb coming out in a bigger battle. And, and, and the tricky thing is what, how, how to choose the battle in a responsible, non-destructive way. In a loving way. Yes. And I think that's the hardest thing to do because you get angry and you want to hurt and you want to, and you want to win. And well, at least I do. And I think a lot of people do. <laughs> Uh, and so it's like, do I sit on this and then go to sleep and then wake up and then talk about it tomorrow when I can actually speak calmly? Uh, you know, and so what is the level of real mental power uh, that you have? And you clearly have worked on it a great deal. Mm -hmm. You have that, but I have a ton of respect for people who, you know, or empathy for people who don't. And, right. and it's like, you know, you, you fly off the handle and then it's like, damn. And then there's shrapnel everywhere, you know. And The challenge is when we fly off the handle, it takes us off of our mission. It takes us off of a life of purpose and a life of actually impacting people or our dreams or whether it's your acting career or something. It takes us off the thing that we want to be doing. Yeah. We put our attention towards anger or the triggers or where we're being hurt. Yeah. That's what I found because I've been really good at winning battles uh -huh. in past relationships and friendships and intimate relationships. And then I feel like crap for days afterwards. Uh -huh. And my energy goes towards feeling like crap as opposed to putting it towards something productive. Sure opposed to being positive and being in service towards other people or yeah. what I want to work towards. So I think that we've got, I've learned the hard way many, many times over and over that that doesn't work. And I'm still trying to figure out the balance of how do I be honest and share how I'm feeling without it being destructive, like you said. And I think that is the ultimate test for so many of us. Oh man, it's a huge, huge Especially challenge. Especially probably with kids and being married yeah. and Oh, there's, and you know, lack of sleep or whatever, the amount of environmental forces. There was, I had, this is kind of comical at this yeah. point, but there's so many kind of uh, healers in Los Angeles. So many. The reason I like, and there's some, you know, frauds, but there's a lot of super <laughs> legit people here. Yeah. And um, I went to this woman, uh, and I'll think of the name of the actual practice. Um, Grinberg is, I believe, the name of it. But basically, it's like, it's like energy moving through breath. But I having been dealing with anger and not wanting it to be destructive, I was turning to this tool that a friend had recommended. And really it's like, if when you're feeling it, she's like, you know, really pay attention to where it is, like in your gut. And then just like, you just like pretend you're pushing against the build, like you're trying to break open a building and you just go, 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 go until you can't and you're holding your breath and you're clenching and you're creating as much tension and then you, and then you just take like, and you just go, 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 and you let it all out. You let all that tension go. 
and then you rethink about your problem again. And there was pretty profound. Wow. But it's, it's really like, there's a physical thing that has to be released. You have to release it. Anger. And it's like, I've air punched, you know, like, even with a kid, like a kid, like doing something, I'm like, if just, if and instead of like showing them, I'll walk around in the living room and it's like, <clears throat> really? Like, oh, just because I'm like trying to not, you know, become Lash destructive. Yeah. Wow. But <clears throat> I, I hope that's more normal to people. You know, I, I, I'm not like the Incredible Hulk or anything. It's just right. like. We I think most outlet. people I talk to where there's it's just angry, <laughs> just angry. <laughs> um, it's hard to be at peace twenty four seven. It's impossible. I mean, it's uh, it, you know maybe you know the Buddha. Uh, who else? It's maybe crazy, Jesus. Right? I don't know. So you're you're focusing on the where the tension, the anger, resentment, frustration is. It's in your stomach, your chest, your throat, your head, wherever it is. And then you're putting your energy and your attention, squeezing it. You're or, making it worse. So you try to like intensify, intensify it. it and get it burned. Until, your until you're tired. Until you like can't and you push it and then you and then you just all your thing to let it go and start breathing like crazy. Huge breaths in, just like releasing it all. Look, sometimes it, it doesn't work. It oh. did when I was working with her, it was working a lot better. I've tried it a couple times. <laughs> it's not so working. It's starting now, to fade. Now you're air punching the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I need a new... No, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know. I think, yeah, I think anger is a big old mystery uh, where, it, you know, where it comes from. And mm. uh, I, I don't... I, it's useful and it's destructive at the same time. Like anything, yeah. It's not good or bad. It just is. So. What has been the... Uh, the journey for you as an actor, you've been 15 years now acting, is that right, or more? Yeah, I think my first professional job was 2003, so 16 years. 16 years? Yeah. And what was that big break? Uh, I was selling knives in New York. Cut code uh, knives, Cut right? code knives, and um, I was doing this very off, off, off Broadway play that a Fox executive came and saw, because there was like, you know, some legit actors in it. And uh, that got me a general meeting with Marsha Shulman who was visiting New York for the upfronts, and I went in and sold her a studio set of knives. I was a very, I Wait, was- Wait, the, the Fox executive. I came and I was like, I never, this is my first general meeting with anybody in the industry, and I- You had a box of knives with you? I, no, I had, I had an order form in my book bag because I just was growing. You know, I actually had them all. Yeah, yeah. You had your knives with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just take it to this acting meet, intro meeting. Yeah, because I think I had a knife appointment after that or something. Shut and up. so I was just like, what is, she's like, what are you up to? I'm like, I'm selling knives. I don't know if you ask me. And, I, and she, I, she bought a studio set, which is a great set. It's four knives. It's the spatula spreader, the petite carver, uh, the super shears, of How course. much is that? At least like 180 bucks. Oh, it's not much. Yeah, yeah. Well, so you, you pitched it to her, you did the demo. This is 2003. Um, <laughs> you did the demo. Yeah, I don't think I cut the penny or the rope, but I did, you know, I, I went for it and she was tickled pink. And so she not only bought the knife, she gave me what's called a holding deal, which is um, pretty nuts. It's basically, they just pay you so that you don't go to another network. Shut so up. I so got, you don't go and act anywhere. Yeah, I got pay paid $75,000 to just be owned, owned by hold. Fox for six months. What? It was crazy. And I had been, I was making, you know, I was- You were making I was, 100 bucks a month. I, things were about to get very interesting in about a month with money running out. So it was like a, I celebrated, I screamed. It was just amazing. And then- Wait, on, In that meeting, she was like, I want to give you a deal here. Uh, I left and my agent goes, that, that meeting went well. Uh, you're, they're offering you a holding deal. Just like that, yeah, within like an hour. Yeah. And then it was absurd because uh, I got flown out to LA, put in a town car, put up at the hotel that I can see from here, right by the Fox lot, and driven around to auditions by a driver. Shut up. How old were you? I was 23. And I was like, that was easy. <laughs> that was like six months in New York. And then uh, like an idiot all went to my head. Uh, well, I was just like, that was so easy. The show got canceled. I got the show called Cracking Up, which was with Jason Schwartzman, Molly Schwartzman, Molly Shannon, Chris McDonald. Mike White wrote it, who's a big writer. Anyway, that got canceled. And uh, I was like, oh, well, what, what's the next one going to come Something on? Something else will come along. I'll yeah. just roll into these auditions. <laughs> won't really prepare. I'm sure they'll get it, you know. Really? Yeah, really kind of like la lazy, non-respecting how competitive and hard it was because I really... It, it, it wasn't hard to get my break. 
in a lot of ways. So isn't it almost that's the mentality you need to go in with though? It's like I don't need this, I don't want this, and almost give it to you for free. It's kind of like a swingers type of Yeah, like yeah. It's like if yeah. you act like you don't need this, like it's your life depends on it, then you're not needy bring that needy attention and energy and they're gonna give it to someone who's actually more relaxed and more it's the such a tricky part of the business because it's like the effort you put in it doesn't pop out it's right. like it's this weird energetic soup where you like confidence and mental health and like belief but you know if you work too hard on something it can get stale so there's this weird little mystery about rolling mm. in and booking something. I mean, you, you want to be prepared and you want to, I, everyone should be working hard on the craft. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you, so did you start booking more stuff and on these auditions afterwards? Oh, I like, didn't work for like a year and a half. Oh, and okay. I was like, all the money I made was gone. <laughs> all of a sudden my apartment in LA started having more roommates and I was like, you know. Paying for rent, yeah. Yeah, cause I was like, and then actually I was about to leave the business. I had a girlfriend at the time who was not into the life and uh, I was like interviewing to become a banker. Shut up. I, I, I was beginning to set up because that's sort of the world I came from. And I was like, here's a stable income. And you like, went to Brown, you did like. Yeah, I could get a job at like JP Morgan probably if I wanted to. So you're 25. Yeah. And you, then. You would go a year and a half of, of not booking anything. Yeah. And I went, I moved to New York. I kind of like, I was like, I'm done. Really? And as I moved to New York, I went into another audition for these Cullen brothers who were actually, I'd done a pilot with, but I like, I just, I was supposed to be playing a thief, like a cool thief. And like, for whatever reason, I just rolled up in like an overfitted suit. Like it was a terrible choice. And I just did it really weird. And they were like, you're perfect for this. They were like, you're in. And I was like, what? And then that became a series. And I was like, it was like right when you're going leaving, it got, and that kind of built this relationship with NBC that kind of went for many years. Wow. Oh, so you did a bunch of shows with NBC. A lot. Yeah. I did like six series for them. Wow. I remember I had a conversation with, um, Max Greenfield. Do you know Max? Well, he was He's on the a new good girl. buddy of mine. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was in the show new with girl, you. Yeah. New girl. And uh, the new did, girl. I love that. It's new girl, right? <laughs> yeah, new girl. No. We were we did CrossFit together. I would see him at the gym every every day. Pretty oh, much. he's a CrossFit nut machine. And so one day, <clears throat> and I would kind of compete with him. I knew he was a little competitive, so I'd be in the rower. But let's go, Max. You know, I'd be competing, and he was like, "Who's this guy?" You're erg. And then um, one day, I was just at Earth Bar right near the CrossFit place and I started talking to him. I go, hey, I got some questions for you. You got, you got a few minutes? And he goes, yeah, sure. We talked for about 30 minutes. And I was like, tell me about your journey of being an actor. Was it, were you always like this big star and like on these hit shows? And he goes, I've been out here for 10 years. Yeah. Freaking struggling. Oh, yeah. And not booking a thing. Yeah. And every time I was going to leave, something would pull me back in. Like I'd mm -hmm. get something small that would be pay me enough for the next two months, three months. And then I'd wait for six months and I'd get something small. And uh, he's like, it took me 10 years to yeah. get like a role that actually paid me something. Yeah, you know, he, he had a journey. He had a real grinder. I mean, and it's, he deserves everything. He's talented. Oh, he's so talented and funny. How long were you on this show, that, uh, on New Girl for? I was, I did, <clears throat> I, I was, I came in season two as like a love interest. And then I got about a boy. So I, I oh, that yeah. lasted two years. And then when About a Boy ended, they decided to bring my character back as to be like the final love before Zoe, like, and J uh, Jake Johnson's character, Nick, like, Get end up together. Uh -huh. So I was sort of like, I would, you know, look, it's not official, but I would say I was like, you know, of all of Zoe's love interest, mm. I was I was the deepest and closest sure. to, to really working. That show did amazing. What was it, six seasons, seven? Seven, I think, officially, and uh, it lives on Netflix, and it's just, uh, it's pretty extraordinary what that streaming is doing, because it, like The Office and, the, and Friends being the most popular comedies on Netflix. It's crazy. Right? So, so. Still. So, New Girl, yeah. I don't, I don't know the numbers, but my sense is from being out in the world and being recognized that, that New Girl has tons of sort of cult followers who are always. Are you recognized the most from that, or yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. I get um, about a boy of bad moms or um, some fired up is a cult classic people love. Uh, mm. And then some always some weird ones like, you know, just out of nowhere. You're like, damn, man, like Perfect Couples was a series I did that has a lot of fans. And then um, 
burlesque. <laughs> I was Stanley Tucci's lover in that, so sometimes I get recognized. <laughs> <laughs> what's the best part about uh, the acting business for you, and what's the worst part? Oh, that's a good question. I think the best part is um, not knowing where you're ever going to be, and that there's this kind of infinite possibility at all times in your life that you can all of a sudden be attached to some project in a new city. You know, we got a call, my wife and I, for example, like in late August, and it was like, do you want to do this movie in Chicago? And within 10 days, I had moved my family there. Wow. We were staying in this great house <clears throat> and exploring a new city with my kids and my wife in the same movie. And it was, I love that feeling of adventure and the fact that you can, that freedom we were talking about earlier, soaring, but that fact that it's achievable in a marriage mm. is really amazing to me. Right. And then um, I think what I don't like is sort of tied to that is that you don't ever know where work's coming and and uh, and also just the amount of waiting around time you do. It's so much waiting, right? You get, you get this excitement, we're gonna launch this series, and then you're waiting, what, three, six months until you start filming and then... Yeah. And then, yeah. and then you're on set all day for like one scene. Yeah, and and like, it's just a lot of just twiddling thumbs. And so it's really, really paramount to have, if you're around fun, good people, you know, then you're hanging. But I've yet, it's hard to be productive. You know, I'm stirring other pots. So, you know, I'd love to like just shadow cruise one day, like on set, like to see how, or like one of these, or The Rock, or someone who's like, acting but like you know it's like an empire on the side yeah. yeah you know his downtime is operating and i'm it's sure he's working. got a bevy of assistance and stuff but like because i love i love that feeling of moving missions and projects forward and and on set it, you kind of it's you get derailed really easily you gotta focus on the craft in that moment yeah and then but then like it's like all right for 10 minutes actually it's an hour so it's like you were you were ready and then now you're you have to stay ready for another hour and are you doing what are you doing to do that are you probably just eating M peanut m and <laughs> right right so yeah who are the most inspiring actors in your mind for you inspiring where you're like man these people are just they inspire I, I, me I actually careers. i'm gonna say it's tom cruise man like I, I just find his energy uh, and zest, and I know, like perfect example. I'm sure he doesn't touch alcohol. Really? Yeah. yeah he's like, oh, clean. it's just he's like, he's just operating. He just seems clear in a way. Not to sign. I'm a Scientologist in any way, and I really don't know anything about it. But I use clear for non-Scientologists. It's like yeah, yeah. people that don't have a ton of clear baggage. is a Scientology term of like it's a, getting clear. Yeah, right? but I don't want them to own that term because <clears throat> right, I think right. it's a great clear mind. Yeah, and you're clear and you're and like you are. You're presenting who you are. You're present with people. You're respectful of people. You're not operating from a place of ego you're operating from a place of isn't this playground world insane and i get to play in it and tom cruise is playing in it on such a high level he's like, a master he's of that literally like flying fighter jets and like helicopters and out of airplanes out. making huge spectacle movies that delight worldwide audiences and then for stuff that i don't like which is like the publicity stuff which this is wonderful but like doing a three minute clip on today's show is just like all stress, no substance kind of thing. Yeah. Just being charming, you know, for three minutes. Uh, he does that like a, he just crushes it. And so, the, yeah. The three minute charm sessions, he's a, the master. Yeah, and I think at that level, they probably extend to 10 to 15 minutes. Right, right, and right. now he's fun and the world is kind of like, he's just this relaxed little, you know, playground for him. So, yeah, his, he's got an electricity that I find. I've never met him, but I really want to. And what would you ask him if you met him? If you had three questions to ask him. Ooh, cruise questions. <laughs> Gosh, I'm gonna have to think three. about that. I may have to send these in. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would ask him, I go, what do you think the number one way to get <laughs> clear is? <laughs> he said, well, I right down the street. The <laughs> it's a good facility, yeah. Um, I would say, how, would you, how do you deal with your fear? Do you think he has a lot of fears? I assume everyone does, and I assume that that's, I, I don't know, I don't know. And if he says he doesn't have fear anymore, I'd be like, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I would want to know his, his morning routine, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe um, his type. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, no, you, those, that's just off the top of my head. Sure, sure. How do you uh, how do you deal with your fear? 
when you're going into uh, oh, it's a gig, hard. a gig, a conversation. A yeah, uh, I'm him. really aware of it, you know. And um, and what is the biggest fear? Uh, being judged, being uh, rejected, or or being judged, like having something I put out in the world judged and ridiculed. But don't you do that all the time with acting? It's weird. It's not the same. Like I've started writing stuff, and you put it out there, and you go, oh, like. It's this terrible feeling. Like I've actually created that. I think you're interpreting words. It's someone else's creation. Yeah. That you're helping co-create. Yeah, and you kind of get a sense. Like, look, I did it. I know I was somewhat real. So it's like now it's on them to like make it, you know, good. You know what I mean? It's like I'm I'm doing the best I can with what I was given, and you can always blame it on someone else or whatever (laughs) the the writer writer is or whatever. But when you create, like if you create a business or something and it fails, like that, yeah, it's a fear of, it's a huge thing and I'm, as that thing that um, I think you say and even Jordan Peterson and Dax have all said, it's that thing of never comparing yourself to other people, it's comparing yourself to who you were yesterday and Mm -hmm. I I find that to be very powerful Uh, and I'm, you know, proud of what I've done the last year because it's really overcoming my fear of putting, getting vulnerable, putting myself out there to be rejected in other areas besides acting. What do you think is on the other side of uh, rejection and judgment? Probably freedom once you get it all. You know, I think, I think I learned early in acting people fear ego death more than actual physical death. So humili- What's ego, uh, humiliation. humiliation. Really? People so, fear the ego death more than dying. That's uh, they, there's been some studies and it's like that's why public speaking makes people yeah. terrified and all those things like getting up in front of people and, and taking risks or asking a dumb question in class, you know. What advice would you give to actors or anyone who's putting themselves out there on a stage in life? Mm-hmm. Um, on how to overcome that. So it doesn't be the loudest voice in their head, but they can go through and kind of experience with more joy and I think it's like anything. It's like just practicing doing it. So if it's it's that, and I'm actually talking to myself because I have a deep yeah. fear of social media. Like I, you're never on there. I, I, I it makes last me post was like June or something. It makes like, me really uncomfortable. Uh, we're gonna do a post today. Okay. Together. <laughs> All right. And I'm like just got nervous. I, I <laughs> yeah. I started scratching my rash. Uh, no, but yeah, I don't know what it is, man. I, I really. But you're an actor. You put yourself out there. I know, all the time. but I'm behind a film of someone else's work. It's it's you're in. It's a professional controlled environment, and I know. The, the raw, like, to you is, is, I think I'm inherently private and I just, I'm so scared of being judged and not liked in some way wow. that, uh, that maybe that's why social media makes me so uncomfortable. Cause like, you know, someone can be like, what a, you know, dumb post or look I think at you. It, I think everyone wants to be liked. Oh I yeah. I think everyone doesn't want the world to hate them. I don't think that's anyone's default. Is like, I'm gonna do this so people don't like me. I mean, you might have something off if you think that way, but most people want others to like them. I want people to like me. I get hurt when people say something nasty about me, but I think I'm also willing to put it myself out there because I believe in my mission more than I care about a few people judging me or saying nasty things. Like, those things will hurt and it will suck, but I'm just like, but this matters so much more. And if I put my energy towards my mission and I let my ego step aside and I focus on the people that are really close to me that I care about, who love me no matter what, um, that's what helps me get through it. It still hurts me, it yeah. affects me, but it's like, I feel like the mission uh, of trying to be in service and help people is, is more important than my feelings of a few people not liking me. Yeah, and when you say that, I immediately go, well, I think my mission isn't quite clear enough mm-hmm. to, to, to overcome my resistance to, to, to those social outlets, you know? Interesting. And, and that if, uh, if I really believed in something specific, because it can be whatever you want it to be, but yeah. I'm not gonna like just talk about the eggs I'm making and stuff no, I like that. that. You know, I don't, I don't have that instinct at all. Sure. And I, and I don't really like getting out of moments. I like being present. Yeah. I, I, I think great. like one of my favorite books is um, Zen and the Art of the Motorcycle Maintenance. And it's a, you know, it's a classic, but it's, it's this idea of like God is in the fully present of anything you're doing. Like you can be washing a dish 
like almost like sacredly and there's and if you're doing it with quality with the intention of quality with a capital q that like somehow god lives there that that's that's where the action is the the purest form uh there's a whole book about it on i don't know that's a facet of it yeah yeah there's a book called the way of the peaceful warrior Oh, that uh, by Dan good. Millman, which is there's a movie out of it too. I'm more of a movie guy, but um, powerful example of a an athlete with a big ego, uh, an all American gymnast who breaks his leg, gets injured, and can't can't perform in his sport anymore for a year or something, and that's his whole dream. And he meets this gas station attendant who he calls Socrates, mm. who teaches him the lessons of being here and now mm-hmm. and this one activity you're working on this moment this washing of the floor is the thing it's yeah. not the the dream of playing and being an all-american it's the present moment is what really matters the most and finding the joy and the love in this moment yeah and finding uh this idea of quality like yeah. like the capital q yeah and it's this thing of like you know, everything has a story and an energy based on like, and you buy a terrible t-shirt that was made in a factory with terrible things. Right. It may look good, but it's going to do something to you, you know? Wow. And it's cause there's, 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 no, no, I love your t-shirts. <laughs> These are made, Nikes are probably not in the best. No, no. I mean, but that idea of that, yeah, of course. That's why qual- things that are made with quality and love, like can have a profound a impact on people yeah. and, and the things you do, even like when I know I'm in the zone, it's when I'm doing the dishes and I'm like, like feeling the water and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to say like, oh, look at this, this dish. I'm thinking about the story of the dish. And then I'm like, what's the best, what's a quality way of like mm. honoring this dish, yeah. getting it. And there's like this, it's like, it's like this dream to make everything you do almost sacred in a way. Mm. Like, and I think when you watch you know, there's this great, um, uh, what's that? E- the, the, the Netflix documentary about eating chef's table. Oh yeah. <clears throat> and there's this amazing episode with a, with a Korean monk who has a garden there and it's like everything she does is, I saw this one. Yeah. It's, yeah, crazy, it's man. so good. And it's like the most simple ingredients and chefs are like, how on earth does it taste like this? It's just it's, rice. It's the, and it's the love. And the attention yeah and it's and uh that's what i'm looking forward to i moved to maine and I, i'm looking forward to that slowness and 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 you know cities have that energy yeah. and i think when you're just in a slow place you're able to kind of okay i can do that there's a, there's a four minute way of doing the dishes and then there's a 10 minute way that may teach me something you know and i don't know yeah, but i'm just gonna experiment with it's that powerful man. i love it yeah. living the main life uh, I want to respect your time because I know you got to catch a flight soon. Okay. Um, I have a couple final questions. This one's called the three truths. Okay. So imagine it's your last day on earth many okay. years from now. Okay. You get to live as old as you want to live. It can be 100, 500. It can be as old as you want to be. All right. But at one point you got to die. And you've got to take all of your work with you. So all of your creations, all of your... Uh, the, the acting videos, the movies, they've all got to go with you. So no one has access to your content, your businesses, the information you put out in the world. They don't have access anymore. You've taken it with you to the next world. And you get to leave behind three things you know to be true from your entire life and all Ooh. of your experiences. All of the lessons you've learned that you would want to pass on to your kids and the world. And you get three things to share what would be your three truths? Uh, nothing is as it seems. Everyone is hurt. Everyone is hurt? Yeah. No, don't, you know, don't be afraid to long hug. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's yeah. a good, that's, I mean, there's probably more to that. It's like no, being no, love, intimate. Love, yeah. You know, I think, uh, you know, fearless love is extremely, uh, extremely powerful. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I'll feel, I don't know, you get in moods, I'll get in closed up moods where I don't really want to be around people. Uh-huh. And, um, and then I've, you know, I, I, I want to, I, I know what it feels like to walk down the street anywhere and just like feel a, a sense of brotherhood with every, every human. Yes. I felt that, but I want it more because it, it's fleeting and it, and it mm. goes. And so trying to churn, trying to figure out, you know, ways to kind of stay in that state, you know? Yeah. 
But that's uh, powerful, man. Yeah, those are good truths. I want to acknowledge you, David, for your childlike joy and oh. curiosity. You've got this joy about you and this this childlike love. This whole time I'm experiencing it with you, and every time I've been around you and on screen, you bring this type of like joy and childlike curiosity and love and, and, and fun and humility and wisdom to you. So I want to acknowledge you for all those gifts that you have. Oh, amazing! Thank and, you. Um, for uh, even though we've only hung out three times now, I feel like we're really becoming good friends with, yeah. the, with the long embraces of <laughs> yeah, all of us. Yeah, will do it. It'll skip some steps I there. know, right? <laughs> so, um, congrats on everything, man. You're doing amazing work in the world. I know you've got uh, a business you're launching. I don't know if you're allowed to share what that is. And if you've got other stuff where people can follow you online, where, where can they go to connect with you? And Oh, well, first, I, I, I mean it. I think... I think uh, what you're putting out in the world and your intention and your mission is, is beautiful. Oh, it's, it's a v truly beautiful thing. And uh, uh, I, I, I think when you go and take everything, you'll have, you'll have left a, a massive imprint on this yeah. place. And I think that's really powerful. Thanks, um, but as far as, yeah, I've got some exciting things. <laughs> it's actually kind of tied into some of the stuff I'm doing, but I'm curious about cues, the way People, it's really hard to unwind and to, and to kind of feel relaxed and to rest. And I'm, I, I think people need physical things sometimes to do that. So I've created this bathrobe company. I have this bathrobe that's really, really lovely. And you put it on and it, and it does that for me. It kind of just tricks me into just chilling and get, getting into a restorative place. And so it's, an upgraded bathrobe, really, of the, yeah. a, 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 an essential that people sort of forgot they need. Yeah, most men don't wear bathrobes. Right, a lot, uh, you know, it depends on your age and, you know, things. So anyway, um, these bathrobes are, will be available around Christmas, and I'll say some stuff on my, it's just my name on Instagram and stuff, and uh, at, at David Walton, and uh, yeah, I'll have some more stuff as we launch this company, and if you want a, a, a nice bathrobe for Christmas, you're, it's called The Perfect Bathrobe by Wakanichi. I like it, man. Yeah, there you yeah. go. You'll have to post more on Instagram now. Yeah, I'm going to have to go. I may have to ask <laughs> you, you for advice. <laughs> I may be coming to you for advice, yeah, actually, time, about time, that. Man. And are there any uh, any new series or shows or movies or projects uh, you're working on? Yeah, well, I just shot this movie called Later Days. It's uh, <clears throat> kind of like a breakfast club, but everyone's 40. It's an independent film. So oh, that's cool. Hopefully in about a year. Uh, it, you can see it in the theater. So that's okay. usually how long it takes. I know. It's annoying, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. It's hurry up and wait, right? Yeah. Amazing, man. Uh, I've got one final question for you. Sure. And it's, what's your definition of greatness? Of greatness? Uh -huh. I think it has to do with integrity. I think it has to do with knowing who you are, uh, deciding how you're going to operate your life, the values, and then putting your money where your mouth is. To me, that's, that's great. It can be small and no one can ever know about you, but if mm. you're living with integrity, that's a super high standard. Mm. There you go. Yeah. David Walton, my man. Thanks, brother.